Okay. Let me announce it. Perfect. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, uh, welcome back to the this QPL session. The first talk in the session is going to be John van der Vetterings and he's going to talk to us about dichotomy between deterministic and probabilistic models in countably additive effectus theory. John, please. Thank you, Stefano. So I realize this title is quite a handful, but rest assured I'll be spending like half the talk just talking about these last two words, effectus theory, and motivating why we care about this. Okay, so to understand that, we first have to start with generalized probabilistic theories, or GPTs for short. And they can be considered generalizations of quantum theory. And they can be described as a collection of systems, which are like physical systems, is what they represent. We have a special system that I will denote by I, which is the empty system, a trivial system. Then we have some set of operations between systems. And there's some special properties of these, namely that uh, the home sets, so the collection of operations between two given systems, are convex sets which uh, you can sort of see as the classical probabilistic action um, between these two functions. And the scalars, so these are maps from the trivial system to the trivial system. They are the real unit interval from zero to one, which represents the probabilities uh, of events. And there's a couple of special operations. I mean, we have states, which go from the empty system to a given system, and there are the, the, the ways in which we can prepare a given system. And then we have the effects, and those are the ways in which we can destroy the system or measure the system. And then we can combine these two things, and if we compose an effect with a state, we get a probability out of this, namely a number between 0 and 1. And this is the probability that the predicate or the effect P holds on the state omega. So this is kind of like the way of human GPTs and what we are going to generalize using effects. So there's a couple of problems with GPTs is why we want to generalize it. Namely, they can't really describe deterministic models. Like, of course, you could put deterministic stuff in there, but you have probabilities on the on, on the outside. You have this convex structure, this probabilistic structure that's just there. And secondly, if you want to use this as generalizations of quantum theory, well, you always have this classical probabilistic interface there. Like, you can't change these real numbers that are in this model. So if you want to go more general on that, you need to use something else in GPTs. So what we're going to do is going to allow for a more general set of scalars, so a more general set of probabilities. And the result would be effective theory. Okay, so to do this, we should ask, what should we replace probabilities with? So what should, what should we replace real numbers with? Well, the real numbers form a commutative monoid. And the same thing holds for just the positive real numbers, so that's also nice. That's the right structure for this. But actually, if we only think of probabilities, so numbers between 0 and 1, we no longer have a commutative monoid structure because the addition is cut off at some point and is no longer defined. So in order to get the right notion of probability here, we need to talk about partial commutative monoids. So these are just like commutative monoids, but instead the operation of addition that's present in the commutative monoid is only partially defined. So when we have an equation of associativity like this, this should be read as when the left-hand side is defined, the right-hand side is also defined, and these things are equal. And we will write uh, this symbol to say that things that uh, the sum is defined, and we'll say that x and y are solvable. Sorry. Okay. So examples. Well, the real unit interval is a PCM, which is what we would hope. Uh, but more like, uh, like more interestingly, if uh, if we take a partial function, so this is just a regular function between sets, but now uh, the image of of, a, of of an element is not necessarily defined. And we can put these things into a category. If I will denote PFN for partial functions. Um, and then it turns out the home set, so the set of partial functions from given set X to given set Y, is a PCM. Namely, we say that two atom elements are summable when their domains of definition are disjoint. And then we define their sum as the union of F and G. Oh, and so uh, partial functions, I'm going to sort of see as my model for, for deterministic uh, classical computation. With sort of the idea being that the total functions here, so the totally defined functions, are my actual deterministic processes. And the partial functions are sort of analogous to trace non increasing uh, maps in quantum theory that sum up to a trace preserving map. In the same way, like a total function is a like, classical trace preserving map. 
Okay, and then there's the, the category of quantum stuff. So I'm going to take it to be the category of uh, unital C star algebras with positive subunital maps. And so in finite dimension, you think of this as CPM. So just uh, uh, and not, not CPM, I guess, but the, um, yeah, just like matrix algebras. Um, and then these home sets, so the, 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 the set of positive subunital maps between two given C star algebras are also PCMs, where we say two elements are summable when the, their image at one is below one. And then we just set the sum to be the regular sum. It turns out that actually these are examples of PCM enriched categories. So that means that the addition structure coming from the PCM is compatible with composition in these following ways. Okay, so um, any commutative monoid is also a partial commutative monoid. But zero one is not a commutative monoid itself, so it's different in some special way. And that's because the one, so the maximal element, has a special role. Namely, it makes it into an effect algebra. So an effect algebra is just a PCM, which has a special element one, such that for every element A, I can find a complement, so that it sums up to one. And when it's summable with one, it must be zero. So again, examples. Uh, the unit interval is an effect algebra. Uh, yeah. Uh, any Boolean algebra is an effect algebra, where we say two things are summable when they are disjoint, and then we take the sum to be the join, and we just have a regular negation for a thing. And then also, um, the set of effects from, for a C star algebra is also an effect algebra, and that's actually the motivating example for why we call it an effect algebra. So now we can define what an effect is. is. And an effect is, is a PCM enriched category. So it has these partial sums defined on the home sets. And we have a designated object I, so a trivial object, such that the category C has coproducts. And these coproducts are compatible with the PCM structure. Now, I'm not really going to define what compatible means, but the goal of these two axioms is that we can see these coproducts as uh, classical combinations of systems. And in fact, these two properties together make the category very similar to sort of a partial byproduct category. So it's almost like the category has byproducts, but they're made partial in a suitable formal sense. And we demand that the maps from a system A to the trivial uh, system is an effect algebra. So we have this maximal element one that's like living in this, in this set. And then we have two extra axioms that relate um, these, this object one to the rest of the structure. So if a map F maps uh, the, the one effect to zero, then the entire map must be zero. And if, um, if F and G are summable at one, then that means they must be summable everywhere. And like um, these things are sort of trivially satisfied by GPTs that are that sort of motivating reason for that. Um, you can also give a more categorically inspired definition of an effect is, but I'm not going to go into that in this, in this talk. And so again, our examples, um, we have the category of particle functions, where the trivial object is just a single object to element set. And the effects are just uh, the power sets of the given set. So this is just a Boolean algebra. We saw Boolean algebras are indeed effect algebras. And the other example is we take the category C algebras with an opposite category. And the reason we need to take the opposite here is that an effect is, can be seen as um, a model of um, like quantum physics or physics in general in the Schrodinger picture, so where we take states to be the important part, while C algebras really take more of a Heisenberg picture where the observables are an important part. So to make the Heisenberg picture of the C algebras into the effect is Schrodinger picture, we need to take the opposite category here. And then the effects are, in fact, the effects of this, as you would expect. OK, so let's see how effectuses actually relate to GPTs. Um, so effects, they form an effect algebra. And this is it can be seen as generalization of this convex structure. So instead of a convex structure, we now have this partially additive structure. And the states form something we call an abstract convex set. Now, it's a bit technical what this means. I'm not going to not, not talk about it here in the talk. You can check out our uh, paper if you want to know more. Um, and as in a uh, as in an, as in a GPT, if we have a state and we have an effect, we can compose them and we get a scalar, which is a map from the trivial object to the trivial object. Now we call these scalars in GPT are uh, elements of the unit interval. But 
now they're going to be something else. So let's see what they are now in effect, like how much more general stuff do we get. So first for the examples in the category of partial functions, these are just the Booleans. So that's kind of what we expect, because it was our model of deterministic computation. So we just have the, tru the two truth values here and one. While our model for quantum mechanics indeed has probabilities as their probabilities, which is also what we would expect in hope of quantum theory. In general, from the axioms of, a, of an effectus, we know that the set of scalars in an effect algebra an effect that has more structure. Namely, we can compose these maps that are that's, that, that, that live in, um, in this home set. And this gives us a multiplication on the, uh, on the scalars. And this turns out to behave quite well with the additive structure. And we can, we can, and we can axiomatize what this structure is. And what we get is an, it's called an effect monoid. So an effect monoid is just an effect algebra, which has an additional multiplication operation. This multiplication operation is associative and it is, and it is, and it is distributive, so it interacts with this addition suitably. Um, it's not necessarily commutative. I'll, I'll, come back, I'll come back to that a bit later. And so we have, again, examples. Uh, the real unit interval with a regular multiplication is an example. Uh, any Boolean algebra, well, it's an effect algebra, as we already saw, but now the multiplication we can just simply define as the, as the meat. And a slightly different example is if we take a compact house or space X and we look at the continuous functions to the real unit interval, this is also an effect monoid with, with a sort of pointwise operations. And in fact, this is the unit interval of a commutative unital C-star algebra. So we saw that um, the, the set of effects of any unit of C-star algebra is an effect algebra. But now, if you also want to have this monoid structure on it, it needs to be commutative. Uh, also, for the category theory uh, enthusiasts here, I want to say that we call them effect monoids because they are, in fact, the monoids in the category of effect algebras. OK. So. Um, let's say well, what we can what we can do when we when we have this structure of scalars on effectors. Like what what can we do with this stuff? Okay, so uh, it turns out that it gives us an action of the scalars on our effect spaces. So we can just by composition with a scalar, we get this sort of uh, action of the scalars on the effect algebra. And you can also axiomatize this action, and that's what we call an M effect module. Now it turns out those M effect modules can be organized into an effectors themselves. If you take and we get a functor uh, from an effectus to this to this category there. Uh, dually, we can also look at the states. So the states have a what we call a weight function. So we can compose it with the with the unit effect, and this sort of tells you the probability that the state has been successfully prepared. So if we think about unital states, uh, like we can think of this as like the trace operator, this one. Um, and so the unital states are the ones that have weight one. The normalized states. Okay, and again, we can axiomatize the structure, and we get what we call a weight m module, which is a PCM which has this m action and it has a suitable weight function here. And you can also organize this into an effectus m a function which is given by uh, assigning to every every system its set of states. And you get this function here. Um, uh, what, what, can you, what can we conclude from this? Well, we can conclude from this that any effect monoid is in fact the set of scalars of some effectors, because we can organize them either as a set of effect modules or as uh, the category of uh, weight modules. And a corollary of that is that there are some really weird effectors, because there's quite a lot of effect monoids. Like if you take um, a, a suitable ordered ring, uh, and you take the unit interval, it's a unit ring, and you take the unit interval of this ring, then you, can, then you have an effect monoid. So you can make some really weird effectors using this. And so the rest of the talk, I sort of want to talk about how we can get away from this weirdness. How can we get something uh, that's slightly more adjacent to GPTs, to, to what we already have studied? And so to do that, uh, we're going to use the realization that um, the real numbers don't just have finite sums. They also have some countable sums. Um, and in fact, if we restrict to just a unit interval, then some, such a countable sum exists even only if all the finite partial sums there exist. So you can um, you can you can make this uh, formal, and you can uh, you can find you can define a sigma PCM. So this is a PCM where we also define some sums of countable sets, 
uh, in a similar way as like they exist in the unit interval. It's a bit technical how to define it exactly, so read the paper if you want to know more. Uh, and again, examples. Um, the home sets in partial functions, uh, they, are sig they, they are sigma PCM, which kind of works because like if you have um, a countable collection of partial functions which have a disjoint domain, then you can still like take a union of them. And now if we restrict the category of C star algebras to W star algebras, so these are from Neumann algebras, and we take normal positive subunital maps, then this is this then every home set also forms a, a, a sigma PCM. Uh, and in fact, these can also be shown to be sigma PCM enriched. Like I need to actually define what that means, but yeah, they are. Um, so then we get to the definition of a of a sigma effectus, which is basically it's just an effectus. But now instead of of finite co-products, we have countable co-products, and instead of like this finite PCM structure, we have a sigma PCM structure, a countable PCM structure. And examples and like the main examples we have here are in the partial functions and for Neumann algebras. And it turns out that these things are a lot more well behaved. And this comes primarily due to the scalars being much more restricted than what they can. Okay, so a thing that turns out to be the case in the sigma effectus is that the effect algebras are omega direct complete. So that means that any increasing sequence has a, has a suprema. This is sort of a weaker version of being a uh, being direct complete partial order. And this is significant because in a different paper to classify omega-directed complete, omega direct complete effect monoids. And so we know that the scalars of a sigma effectors are in fact omega-direct omega complete effect monoids. So this really helps us because it, this tells us that any such effect monoids, so the scalars of a sigma effectors, embed into a direct sum of two effect monoids, where the first one is just a Boolean algebra, and the second one is just this collection of uh, continuous functions from a given, from a given topological space. Which is basically a continuous, which is basically a commutative C star algebra. So we've managed to get this really abstract thing, an omega direct complete effect monoid, and reduce it to these two very well known things, namely a Boolean algebra and a commutative C star algebra. And in fact, one of the consequences we get of this is that the scalars and the sigma effectors must be commutative, which would be really hard to show otherwise. Okay, in fact, we can say more. Um, it turns out that all these properties for a sigma effectors are equivalent. Um, which is that states can be normalized. So this is kind of usually uh, assumed implicitly in a, in a GPT, where it's like, if I have a state which, uh, which does not map the trace to one, then I can normalize it so that it is. And it's equivalent to these other nice uh, algebraic or categorical properties. But even more surprisingly, it turns out that there's only three possibilities for this to happen. Namely, the scalars must be trivial, namely only zero, or there must be the Booleans, or there must be the real unit interval. So we get from these like sort of categorical nice structures, we get this dichotomy between the real unit interval and the real unit. So we can translate this result on the scalars to a result on the effectuses, mainly that sigma effectors for normalization come in three types. If the scalars are just zero, then it must be equivalent to the single object category with a single morphism. So it's just a trivial category, it's not interesting. Well, if the scalars are zero, one, then the category is deterministic. So we take a state and we take a, um, a, a predicate next to it, then this must either be zero or one. So we have sort of a deterministic theory here. And if the scalars are the unit interval, then it's probabilistic and we have something that's really close to a GPT. Okay, we can actually say more when you have some operational assumptions, usually assumed for GPTs. So I'm just gonna introduce those now. So we say that an effect has state separation when any two maps f and g are equal when they're equal on, on, on all states. So this, this is again, this is usually um, called uh, uh, operational equivalence in the GPT uh, literature. And it can also be stated categorically that this functor here is faithful. Uh, we can sort of dually, we can define effect separation so that two maps are equal when they're equal on all effects. And examples are that the partial functions, the category of partial functions has both state and effect separation, and the same holds for C star algebras and W star algebras. Uh, an interesting non example is the category of effect algebras. For instance, we can take the effect algebra of projections on a Hilbert space of dimension greater than two, and, and, then, and then the Cochrane Specker theorem says that the state space must only contain a zero state. So we don't have a state separation in this effectus. Um, 
which sort of motivates why you would want state separation as an assumption, because of course we don't want to have this as a sort of good model of quantum theory, because we have this like very quantum projections in Hilbert space, and we only have this zero one uh, state. Okay, so uh, if we assume this stuff, so if we have an a sigma factors and say the scalars are just a boolean, and we have state separation, then it turns out we can embed this effectors into partial functions. So this category of partial functions is the most general deterministic sigma effectors in this sense. Um, in a different picture, we can also embed it into Boolean algebras, which is also like a very classical way of thinking about this stuff. So if we have an effect, the sigma effect is where the scalars are zero one, it's basically entirely classical. So this means that if we want to study non-classical stuff where the sigma effect which is normalization, we must take the scalars to be the unit interval. So we get these probabilities out of necessity. Um, a bit more uh, technical is uh, that we can also embed uh, a, sig a sigma effect where the scalars are the probabilities. Um, namely, they can be embedded in something called order unit spaces, which are these well-behaved uh, real vector spaces. Um, and they also have some different properties related to the norm and to Suprema. And it turns out if you have sigma effectors where the scalars are probabilities and you have effect separation, and you can embed such an effectors into these uh, Banach order unit spaces. And this is a very GPT-like category. It's basically GPT is an infinite dimension. So we just get back GPTs out of these categorical considerations. Okay, as a summary. We've shown that a non-trivial sigma effectors, which is normalization, must be either deterministic, so the scalars are zero one, or they must be probabilistic, so that the scalars are the unit interval. When it is deterministic in a state separation, it must embed into partial functions or Boolean algebra, so it's entirely classical. And when it is probabilistic and has effect separation, it embeds into Banach or the unit spaces, and hence they reduce to the sort of standard GPT-like thing. So we managed to go from a very abstract framework or you went to concrete well-studied standard settings. Okay, there's some future work we would like to do, which is study general sigma effectuses so that we don't assume normalization. Because for instance, um, um, Chris Heune and Chantal, if I'm not mistaken, they studied this, um, this setting where the probabilities are over a space so that your probability of something holds can differ on your, if you're on a different point in space-time. And like if you allow more general scalars, then we can also do this in the factuses. Um, there's an inherent categorical characterization of normal effectuses, but it doesn't really work with sigma effectuses. So it would be nice if you could sort of find a very clear categorical characterization of sigma effectuses and do that, like, uh, and do that here. Okay, that was all I wanted to tell you. Thank you for your attention, and let's if you want to learn more. Thank you very much, John. And uh, so let me, can you hear me? Yes, fantastic. So let's clap in the channel. And I also wanted to uh, thank John especially for all his hard work on the technical side of this conference, because getting this to run smoothly was hugely thanks to his contributions. So thank you for that as well as for your talk. Thank you. So I will now ask you a few questions. From the, there's been a, quite some discussion. I have to say I'm culpable of some of it. Um, but someone else had this, a similar question to mine, so I will ask it nonetheless. Can't you always extend a partial commutative monoid to a commutative monoid? Because then you'd get some categories which are enriched in commutative monoids, and this gives you a setting similar to what other people do in other categorical theoretical settings. So this is a bit subtle. Um... Mm -hmm. In sort of this, um, you can sort of make a functor between partial, partial commutative monoids and commutative monoids, but I'm not sure this is like an isomorphism, isomorphism of categories. That was a co-reflection of categories. So it's you can do it, but you lose something in the process. Like you need some, I think you need like a cancellation property on the, the on the partial uh, um, on the, the, the the partial structure to to get this. Um, but yeah, in like a lot of settings, you can do this. If you do it with partial functions, I think you get multi-sets. And if you do it with um, with uh, positive subunit maps in Caesar algebra, you get all positive maps. Um, and there is this general construction for effectuses where if you take a byproduct category, which is like discard maps in a in a appropriate manner, then you can make an effectus out of it. 
And you can sort of reverse this sometimes. So it is also like a relation there. I see. Okay, so that was my question and that was seconded by other people. But let me go to some of the other questions. Um, Richard East asks, has there been any work looking at the GPT-based informational axioms of quantum mechanics from the perspective of effectus algebras? Would you expect any particular advantage from doing this? I'm not sure what is meant with informational axioms. I'm assuming it means sort of the reconstruction of quantum theory uh, side of it. Um, I think so. Um, the answer is sort of yes. But most of the work uh, has so many assumptions on the effect algebras that they're basically vector spaces again. Um, in my thesis, I will use these results that I've talked about here, especially the characterization of effect models, to go from like, um, like to, to try to do this basically, uh, to reconstruct quantum mechanics from effect algebras instead of from vector spaces. Okay. I see. Uh, let me see. I think there was uh, one more question by Cole, which was also answered by Bas, but I'll ask it anyway. Is the sigma PCM enrichment of partial functions related to its usual partial order enrichment? Um, uh, yes. Yeah, there's the same. Yeah. That's what Bas said. Okay. Uh, thank you so very much again. And thank you for your. Uh, oh, wait. No. Uh, Vlad had a quick fire question. Uh, what kind of infinite sums are allowed in a sigma effectus? So, um, so I tried to give the semi-technical explanation, which is like if you have you have like a countable set of things, and then you say it's, say it's summable when every finite set is summable. Um, and there's like some associativity condition, so that like it doesn't matter in which order you sum them, like the answer must be the same. But um, yeah, basically, um, um, if every set is soluble, the countable set is soluble. That's basically the definition. I see. Okay. Well, let's see if Vlad has some follow-up question on the channel. Thank you again so very much.